continue to go through a transition to a hopefully better life and understanding of what matters to us all, such as family, love, and hope. Respectfully, Michael Katetwan Johnson. So um, without further ado, I am going to uh, introduce the first panelist. Oh, I did also wanna say that um, you've already noticed that we do have ASL live interpretation today. So thank you to William and Lauren for that. And then thanks also to Kate Jewett Williams, who is doing all of our tech today. So I'm gonna introduce the first panelist, Terrell Dew Johnson. Terrell Dew Johnson is, Tahana, is a Tahana Autumn contemporary basket weaver, sculptor, and health advocate. His work has appeared and won awards at Santa Fe Indian Market, the Autumn Tash, the Heard Museum Guild Fair, and the Southwest Museum's Indian Art Fair. In 1996, with Tristan Reeder, Johnson co-founded Tohono Autumn Community Action, or TOCA, a nonprofit community development organization dedicated to promoting autumn arts and reviving native foods through a farm cooperative and restaurant program. In 2013, he launched Native Foodways Magazine, a publication on the culinary innovation and cultural significance of Native American foods. Terrell is a 2017 recipient of a Master Apprentice <clears throat> Award from the Southwest Folkwife Alliance for his work passing on traditional knowledge of Tahana Autumn basket weaving. Terrell? Yeah, thank you. Well, my name again is Terrell Du Johnson. I'm from the Tahana Autumn Nation and I am a basket weaver. I've been weaving uh, baskets since the age of 10 and uh, started out doing traditional basket weaving. Um, I learned from my from several teachers, um, Margaret Acosta. I learned from uh, Lolita Manuel and from Clara Javier. So those were the we weavers that taught me their techniques over the years. Um, so I acknowledge them and, and thank them for giving me this gift. Um, so I've been weaving, started out traditionally for several years, um, experimenting, uh, evolving into what I currently do now, which is more of contemporary installation pieces. And I, um, a lot of people, you know, ask, well, what makes basket weaving contemporary? So I, I and I just tell them, you know, I don't do um, the regular style of Donna Autumn basket weaving, which would be like split stitch or close stitch with designs. Um, I, I, I experiment with different types of material. Um, right now, I'm currently working on this huge installation piece for um, the new uh, US Embassy in Paraguay. And it's a 20 foot uh, basket that incorporates wire and uh, paper. Um, and so, um, so those are the kind of materials that I'm using currently. But I do a lot of um, experiment with five, with different fibers like um, uh, different plant materials from different parts of the country. Um, being a basket weaver and traveling around and meeting other basket weavers, uh, we start um, exchanging fibers. So I exchange fibers with basket weavers from um, the, the north uh, west area, um, Haida weavers like um, cedar barks, um, different um, ferns. Um, on the east coast, um, especially in Maine, I exchange uh, material using um, brown ash um, that a lot of the Maine weavers use, sweet grass. Uh, so, and then in California, you know, a lot of rosebud and um, uh, tule. Uh, I love working with tule. So uh, a lot of these fibers I, I learn and got familiar with and incorporate those into a lot of my, my pieces. So um, I can actually show some examples of some of the, the, the work that I, I've been doing 
in the past few years. Um, let's see, Kimmy, are we gonna show some photos? So while we're waiting for the photos to pop up, um, uh, this is actually, okay, this is a photo. This is one of the first photos. Um, this photo was taken, I think, when I was either 17 years old. And this is the last basket weaver teacher I had, Clara Javier. And Clara was in her um, 80s when this picture was taken. And she uh, started to lose her lose her eyesight so she wasn't really making as many baskets as she wanted to because of the loss of her eyesight so she um had sought me out to um, weave this owl basket and she heard that um i made really good owl baskets and so she wanted me to make this basket that was ordered but she could not do so she asked me if i could do it and i did um, the thing was that with Clara, she only spoke uh, Otham, and I, I, I can't speak the language. Um, so my grandparents were um, interpreting for us. And so she explained that, you know, she had gotten this order but couldn't fulfill it. So she wanted me to, to, to weave this basket for her. Um, so this was the start of a friendship that we, we developed. And from there on, every summer, I would go over to her house and spend pretty much every summer there weaving with her and listening to stories and learning her technique. And um, so um, at the end, Clara had completely gone blind. And a lot of the baskets that I would make, she always would want to hold them and touch them and feel them and smell them. So um, this, was, uh, um, this was Clara. So the next piece, next photo that I wanted to show um, is one of the um, latest pieces that I've done. And so this actually uh, happened by accident. Um, I was working with some interns and we were putting together this piece here and it had fallen on the ground and it was originally supposed to be a vase, but it had opened up and it had left, it, it had, opened up like this. And I thought this was actually pretty interesting. So what we did was we added some horse hair that I've been working with lately. And we sold them into, into this piece here. And um, um, this was, this was a, a, a piece that was created by accident. And this is one of the, um, one of these pieces that I was inspired by a potter. Um, Nancy um, Youngblood, who does a lot of, she, I think she's a, a, a potter from um, one of the Pueblos in New Mexico. And she is a famous, um, she comes from a famous um, line of, of potters in, um, in New Mexico. And uh, her pot, she makes these melon pots that have these grooves in there. And so um, I work with um, an architect firm, Miranda Lash, and we actually design compute. Uh, we design baskets and computers, and so I had bought the idea of making these vases that had these grooves in there. So they went and they developed this program where they had made the these patterns, and with these patterns, I would sew these um, individual pieces together to create these grooves and to create the shape of a vase. But um, like I said, this um, had fallen on the floor and opened up like this. And I thought this was beautiful. So I started making these baskets um, like this. So the next um, slide um, is one of my favorite pieces, the gourd baskets. And I've been working with gourds for a long time and I had um, um, saw these pieces and I, I, with the gourd, you know, you can cut into it and it'll keep its, its form and it'll, it'll keep the shape of the, the, the grooves that you cut into it. So I had made these deep valleys or these deep dips in these gourd baskets and started weaving on top of them. 
And the thing with a lot of my contemporary pieces is I like to incorporate uh, a little bit of the traditional materials in there. So it sort of keeps me connected with the two different worlds that I, I, I think I'm weaving with. And so this basket has bear grass that I purposely aged and um, I stitched with, um, with um, wax nylon uh, to uh, to this gourd piece here, and it created these these grooves and these these open dangle things on there. So um, and this is kind of like my go to pieces that I do quite a bit. And with gourds, you can work with gourds that the gourds that are big as say fifteen inches across to gourds as small as you know, an inch or three inches. So I, I get to work with all these different types of those gourds. And I guess you can say right now I'm a Gordy. So I actually travel around the West um, area, um, like California um, and New Mexico and and get these, um, the, go to these gourd farms and, and just go crazy with these gourds. So the next slide that I, I would like to show you um, is one of my favorite pieces. I uh, recently done a show called Meeting the Clouds Halfway. And again, it was a contemporary um, collaborative show that I do with, um, that I did with um, Aranda Lash. And um, this piece we, we titled Endless Knot. But with a lot of my pieces, I like to make statements. Um, and uh, the reason why I made this piece here um, was it had creosote bush in it. And it was very fragrant when, when, when we put the piece together and hung it in the gallery. Um, and if anyone's ever smelled um, wet um, creosote, it smells like the desert, like rain. And the reason why I used this material in this piece here was to make a statement about how um, in the Dona Atham um, culture, creosote is a multi-purpose um, medicine. It, um, it um, heals little scratches and mosquito bites. It also, it, when you drink it, can soothe the stomach if you had an upset stomach. But it also can help with, um, with um, your feet if you have callous feet. Uh, also, like if you're camping and if you have mosquitoes, you can put some creosote on the, on the fire and the smoke will keep the mosquitoes away but it's also used for blessing and, and smudging. So this is a, a multi-purpose um, medicine that we use. Um, and so the reason why I used um, that material in this piece is because when it dries, it gets very brittle. And so all the leaves fall off. And the statement that I was making with this piece is that when the pieces, when the leaves fall off, it, it just leaves the little um, branches there and it looks pretty bare. And the reason why is because, you know, if we, because of the development and what's going on with the land and how a lot of these medicine are being bulldo are bulldozed and burned just to make way for new development houses. And if we, if we keep, if we um, continue to do that, we're gonna lose our medicine. And so that was a statement I was making with this piece here with the endless knot. Um, the next um, slide that I think we're going to show. Um, were those all the slides I had? Uh, I don't. Yeah, I think those are all the slides we have from you, Tara. Okay. Well, again, those are the pieces that um, are are the contemporary pieces that I've been doing lately. And um, I really like uh, working um, in this medium and experimenting with the different fibers and the different textures. Um, Aranda Lash, who I've been working with, the architect firm for about close to 15 years now, um, have been very uh, adventurous and very accommodating with the ideas, the crazy ideas that I, I have. So I was very fortunate that they, they um, can appreciate the, the wacky, crazy ideas that I have and can work with me. And I'm very, um, I'm, I'm very uh, happy and really glad that, you know, we started working together and started creating these amazing pieces that 
um, people can can enjoy. So um, yeah, so I you know also I I've been a teacher, a basket weaving teacher for several years as well, and I travel around the country um, teaching classes and doing lectures on basket weaving. Um, but I also um, teach here in the community. I, I've been teaching here in the community for the past 30 years and very fortunate that a lot of the, the kids that I've taught have continued to, to become basket weavers. And um, I just have been very fortunate to have basket weaving as my, my um, part of my life that it's been able to to take me um, places that I never would have dreamt would have I, I never would have been, you know. So I'm very happy, and I'm very also I'm very glad that I'm continuing this culture, this tradition in, in my community, and that I'm able to pass it along to other community members that um, so that it won't die. And I'm really um, happy and proud of my students that continued uh, to carry it on and. I'm hoping to be a teacher in the community for a very long time so that I could pass on the knowledge that I, that I have of basket weaving, like the teachers before me. Okay, I think I'm- Great. Yeah, thank you so much, Terrell. That's such yeah. a um, beautiful uh, introduction in many ways to this idea of, um, change and adaptability in, in, your, in your story of learning traditions and then uh, extending them into new forms. So thank you. And I was struck so much um, when, I, when I interviewed you some months ago um, by that journey. So thank you. Um, we'll move to the next panelist. And, and when we come back, we'll be able to ask Terrell um, also about some of the changes that he's been seeing um, I did want to mention that I that Climate Lore is funded in part by Arizona Humanities. I forgot to mention at the beginning, um, and so I wanted to thank them for supporting this series. And I'd like to introduce Alice Manuel, um, a basket weaver in the Ankh Akamel autumn tradition, and a member of the Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian community. Alice is a 2017 recipient of a Master Apprentice Award from the Southwest Folklife Alliance in recognition of her artistry in education. Welcome, Alice. Hello. Um, that sounded really good. <laughs> um, I just want to say uh, my name is Alice Manuel, and um, I've been weaving for um, a little over uh, 36 years, and I started um, back in the early 80s, and um, I guess I can honestly say that my love for weaving or, or the, the um, I guess what really hooked me to, to, weave, to learning how to weave or, or the curiosity of weaving, and I, you know, I'm not sure if you're familiar with where I live in Salt River, it's we're nestled between um, major cities of, well, right next to Phoenix, and we're we're right between Mesa and Scottsdale, um, and a lot of our ways, um, kind of our, our traditional ways, had disappeared real early on because of where we're located. Uh, a lot of the different types of um, weavings and um, I guess we, we, I guess you'd say cultural ways, um, pretty much. Um, were set aside because we, we're so close to the cities and those major impacts that that cities have on people um, were um, I, I guess I could say that our 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 people were kind of victims of it uh, because right away they went straight to work um, you know nestled in between these cities were were having to make make a living um, they're just so close to us, so that um, cultural impact did impact our people. And one of the things that was affected is the weaving. So when I was growing up, um, 
there was probably a handful of weavers here in Salt River. Um, my earliest recollection of weaving was, and I think I I uh, wrote, I I mentioned this in my um, my interviews with Kimmy, and also when we did the grant um, uh, applying for the grant, was talking about what weaving meant to us, and it was as a child I remember seeing baskets um, on top of my mom, my, my grandma's, um, my maternal grandmother, oh, excuse me, paternal, my, my dad's mom, uh, on top of her refrigerator. Um, and they were just stacked. And they were, they were uh, very fascinating. And as, as a child, I was wondering, you know, what were those? You know, why were those there? But they were, they were beautiful. They were huge. There was like maybe um, four or five deep on uh, top of the fridge and then another one on her on her on her um, uh, kitchen cabinets way on top and um, so um, that was my earliest recollection because people didn't have them all over the place and like I, I hardly I didn't even see any in my home growing up outside of my grandma's house so um, I think I was in second or third grade we we had a um, um, a, what they call a trade fair here in Salt River, where people would come and they have dancers and singers and demonstrators and a, like a carnival type um, event going on. And um, so we went there, it was just across the street from our school. So we walked over and there was a table there and there was a basket on there and it had it all stuck in there. And uh, there was no one at the table. And I figured whoever was there was demonstrating and then they walked away but seeing that basket there with an all stuck in there it was very fascinating to me it was it was it, it from that I can still remember the basket the design everything that uh, about that memory it just I think that was a a, a very um, life-turning experience for me and um, I would ask my mother how you know we, that I, I told her, you know, I told her what what I saw, and then she said that <clears throat> that's the kind of weaving our 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 people did, and there's hardly any people doing it anymore. And um, so, um, going, you know, uh, what do you call it? Fast uh, moving forward. Um, when I started my family and um, in the community here. Um, there was a class offered and so me and my mom decided we were going to take that class because um, we knew that the lady who was teaching it um, her name was Hilda Manuel and she was the last active weaver here in Salt River we had other weavers but they didn't um, they weren't really active a lot of them were very elderly um, they pretty much um, stopped weaving but she was the last one in the community that would go to school. She would, she would go to like all the like Mesa public schools, Scottsdale schools. Uh, she demonstrate at different places like um, um, like the Herd Museum. There's this place, this other thing called the Don's Trek that used to happen on Superstition Mountains. They would go over there and she would demonstrate there. Um, so. The, the community through, uh, I think it was funds through from Save the Children, they put together a class so that they wanted to make sure that the weaving continued here in the community. So um, my mother and I took the class and we took it together. And so we learned together and, and it was awesome. I, um, there was maybe, there was a lot of people there. It was just, it was a small room and there was like standing room only. and. So the big, the first class they got together and they kind of um, let everybody know what the class entailed, um, helped us to um, understand, you know, the process. And um, from there, I was just hooked. I, I would weave um, um, in the nighttime when my kids were asleep because by this time um, I, I had my second child and um, so I was always, I always taught, I was told that because I was, I had small children that it was going to be hard to weave. Um, but I did it when they were asleep. I did it. 
as much as I could. It was just like, I was so um, uh, fascinated by it. And it just, it just very, very much um, really drew me in. And I just really loved it. And I still, I still love it. it it's, it's, um, it's, um, I, I listened to what Terrell said about it, about this kind of weaving, opening doors, and it can, it did. And I, at the beginning, you know, when my mother-in-law, because the lady who taught me was my mother-in-law, she said, she said, you know, if you do this kind of weaving, it's going to feed you. And I, I was thinking literally like, okay, I'm gonna make baskets. And, and if I sell a basket, then I'm going to buy food. But it was it, the, the, the what she was saying was way deeper than than just that you know literally um, those doors that open from learning how to weave you know not only um, uh, opportunities to meet new people and and opportunities to um, um, get your name out there and you're, you're a weaver and the the pride and joy that you that gives you but um, what it also did for me was taught me life skills that as a person, um, a, a young mother, um, it, it, it taught me something so valuable that I don't think, um, I, don't, I wouldn't know where I would be if I didn't learn how to weave. Um, you know, it taught me patience, respect, understanding, um, and, this, and that love for uh, plants and the environment. Um, um, and for people, for, you know, it was, it's just, it's so broad, the, the different things that, it, that this, this gift gave me. Um, so when, when, you know, it, that was one part of it, but it also teaches you um, about how, what my responsibility was as a, as a person or as a mother or as a weaver. And so um, when I first started early on, I was just making baskets and just learning for me and getting and, and working on my skill. Um, but as time went on, um, and I remember things that my mo mother-in-law would say, um, she would say, um, you know, this kind of work was, was, was for, for women. And this is what your responsibility is, you know, you, to help you take care of your families and to make you strong and to to be able to provide for them. And then another part was um, that you have to make it has to continue. You can't keep this to yourself. And um, so what she said to me was, or to the to the whole class was pretty much, you know, teach teach others, teach other other people, um, even, even if they're not autumn, if they're having autumn babies, if, you know, teach those, teach those um, people so they can, they can, this kind of weaving was given to us from the beginning of time and it has to live, it has to keep living because um, all the plants that were put here, you know, way back in the beginning of time, they're they they're all here for a reason, and you have they have to be used. They have to feel like they're, um, you know, they were put here for that reason. So we have we we should do it. We have to do it. So um, so I, I made that a, a personal goal of mine to teach as many people as I can I could, and I started teaching in the early '90s here for in the community. Um, taught I don't know how many women, young girls, and a few men. Um, so, you know, I just, I, I just can't say enough about the kind of weaving that I've done, you know, that I've, that I've, um, had the experience to, um, to, to do. And, um, these are a couple of the examples that I've been working on. And, um, I've, I've realized that over time that my weaving has changed, you know, with just different things that are, um, I guess that I'm going through as a person, um, but I'm I'm really really when I when I and I can't weave all the time, but when I do, I I, I was telling Kimmy in in our um, in our uh, interview that um, when I have to put my weaving away because I'm I'm 
you know, doing something else or because I work full time too. And um, I, I just miss them. And I, I just feel like I feel like I see a long lost friend and it's really, it really makes me feel good. So this is a crown that I made for um, our junior Miss Salt River uh, a, a few years back. And I think it's since been retired, but this is when I was um, probably at the plateau of my weaving going, doing really well. So my weaving has changed over the years. And then th these are examples of some of the work my daughter has been doing. So um, she's, and she was my, my apprentice and um, she's doing really well in part of our, and here, here's the two of us uh, uh, demonstrating. I look all sad, don't look at me. <laughs> but um, yeah, we, we were doing the demonstration and we really enjoy, it. it's, a, it's, a lot of, it's a lot of fun meeting people and, and um, the interest that people have and the um, genuine caring that they show by coming to your table and talking to you and and uh, supporting you and being supportive is, is is awesome. So I'm really happy that I that I can that I can do this still and still be able to teach others. And I could talk on and on, but I won't. <laughs> Thank you so much, Alice. Uh, it's, 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 it is wonderful to listen to you. So we. We, we would happily listen to you all night, but we will also let Dan speak. <laughs> but we'll, we'll come back, we'll have questions for you. So we'll come back to you. Awesome. So thank you. So um, lastly, but not least is um, Dr. Daniel Ferguson. Um, and Dan has been, was really helpful. Um, so Alice actually was the impetus for this project. When an early interview with her, I learned that she, um, was noticing some changes in the availability of the plants that she uses to weave. And so um, that birthed this idea for a, a series of looking at the ways that um, indigenous and folk communities were having their, um, their work and their livelihoods uh, impacted. Um, and and um, Dr. Ferguson has been, was really helpful in, in helping me think about um, early on some of the climate implications of um, some of my questions. Um, Dr. Daniel Ferguson is an assistant professor in the Department of Environmental Science, assistant professor in the Arizona Institutes for Resilience, and director of the Climate Assessment for the Southwest CLIMAS program at the University of Arizona. A human environment geographer, Dan contributes to and leads inter and transdisciplinary teams that conduct place-based problem-oriented environmental research. The overarching goal of his work is collaborative development of relevant and useful knowledge to prepare for and respond to societal problems related to climate variability and change. Thanks, Kimmy, and thanks for having me. And I could also listen to Alice and Terrell um, speak all day. So I will actually try to be as brief as I can. So I think what I'm gonna do is um, I'm gonna try to situate um, this conversation um, about the climate lore this conversation. You guys can see that, Kimmy, you can see those slides now? Yes, I can. Thank you. Um, sort of in the, in the broad category of environmental change um, and change generally um, that we're experiencing. So um, I started thinking about this when Kimmy asked me to participate today. And I started thinking about this year, of course, it's an interesting year to have this um, event because everything's so weird. Um, but also 2020 is potentially, um, for better or worse, a window into our climate future, um, which is sort of suboptimal. Um, so, those of us who live in Arizona, especially Southern Arizona, and actually through most of the West, experienced a very hot summer. Um, in fact, we broke records all across the Southwest and through much of the West. So it was very hot. Phoenix, um, in fact, this week is, we're still breaking records in Southern Arizona for heat. So it was a very hot year. Um, excuse me. <clears throat> the monsoon was essentially a bust this year. So we didn't really get, you know, one of the major pulses of precipitation we get every year. 
Um, and of course, both these factors um, lead to widespread drought conditions. So why is this relevant for this kind of conversation? Well, the, the reality is that, you know, the kind of art that Allison and Cheryl both do um, rely on all sorts of uh, materials that come from the environment. Um, and these changing conditions, of course, directly impact availability of those materials, um, as Kimmy just alluded to um, in the conversation she had with Alice. So this year is a terrible year. Um, is it the future? I don't know if it's the future or not, but it's, a, it's sort of looking like um, what we've been expecting. Um, every few years, we might get a year like this. Um, and then unfortunately, the, the way that's looking for the winter is <laughs> it's not great either because um, there's a Pacific pattern called La Nina, which has taken shape. Um, and that tends to mean dry and actually quite warm conditions for the Southwest. So is that a forecast for, you know, ever? Is this what 2020 gonna look like every year? Uh, is every year gonna look like 2020? No, definitely not. I mean, that's not gonna happen. It will rain again and it won't be so hot every summer. Um, but the odds are tilting pretty heavily because of environmental change, climate change, toward years like this one, which is a real bummer. Um, and also in reference to both what Alice and Terrell mentioned, you know, one of the big issues in Arizona, um, the, one of the big changes in Arizona that's happened over the last 50 years or more, is of course development. Um, and the sprawl in both our big metropolitan areas, Phoenix and Tucson, the surrounding areas, um, has real implications for both the kind of art and culture um, that uh, Alison Terrell talked about and that their work. Um, and also just in general, it doesn't help with the climate problem. Um, specifically, uh, as it gets hotter, the cities heat up quite a lot more because of the amount of pavement. So that stuff's all kind of a drag, um, but it is kind of the context of, of where we're living and the times we're living in. So more um, aside from the grim stuff, I think what Alice and Terrell are talking about and what they do are extremely good examples of um, resilience. And in their case, it's art, they're artists, brilliant artists, um, maintaining a tradition, um, adapting con to conditions um, in both uh, Terrell and Alice's art, you'll see materials coming in um, that they, they choose to use now that maybe their ancestors wouldn't, have, their previous artists wouldn't have used. So that's the sort of frame that I'm thinking about in terms of the connection between environmental change and culture and art and community is there's a lot of built in sort of um, capacity within communities and with individual people um, to deal with change. Okay, so that's a sort of winding way of saying um, it's, a, it's a changing conditions um, but communities are actually working on this kind of stuff. So I just want to mention briefly a project that I'm part of that um, is a, a collaboration between several communities in the Arctic. Um, it's actually funded by the National Science Foundation's Arctic um, Research Program. So it's, it's communities in the Arct indigenous communities in the Arctic and here in the Southwest. Um, and it's called the Indigenous Foods and Knowledges Network. And the big picture idea is to support and promote um, community sovereignty. Um, in indigenous communities, and but in the context of change. Um, it's called the Foods and Knowledges Network because that's the focus is on indigenous food and knowledge systems, again, in the context of change. So this is a, a network project. So we're actually just connecting people to one another, um, communities to one another, communities to scientists like me. Um, and part of that process was um, developing a set of guiding principles for this project, which is um, guiding it. I'm not going to read all these, but the important thing is this is the, the founding principles of the, um, of the project. The important thing is uh, that we're focused on community-led and community-driven work. Um, and so the changes that are happening that are of concern, it's how does my community, the Western science community, contribute to helping, not going in and saying this is the change that's happening. It's like what's the change you're seeing? How does that impact what you're doing? How can we um, support um, resilience or adaptation work going forward in your community, that sort of stuff. So this project is, is kind of interesting because I also have some pictures. It's, also, it's interesting because it's really, because it's not so much a research project, but more like a connecting people project. Um, it's really focused on a series of, of get togethers, of gatherings. Um, and so this slide, there's a few pictures. The, the pictures on the left um, are from the Atna uh, Athabascan village of Chickaloon in Alaska. Um, the community invited uh, our, our network uh, to participate in their annual culture camp. Fortunately, this is all before COVID, so this is in 2019. Um, and I think it reflects on some of the stuff that um, Terrell and Alice have talked about, which is you see in the upper, um, upper left picture there, that's uh, kids learning how to um, 
prepare a, a moose hide. Um, and in the bottom, um, this is a preparation of, of salmon for smoking. Um, and this camp is focused on intergener intergenerational knowledge transfer, just as again, like Alice and Terrell talked about with their mentors and also their teaching, the idea of passing on traditions um, that are part of the community and to keep the community strong and resilient in many, many ways. The pictures on the other side of the slide, the right side, are actually from the Southwest, um, the Tonotham. Uh, we had Tonotham hosts, uh, I think that was last year, last fall maybe. Um, and we spent some time, you can see Amy Wands in that picture, she's leading a little conversation here about um, return of traditional um, efforts to return traditional agricultural practice, which of course Terrell knows all about um, in, in uh, Tonotham Nation. And then the picture in the lower right there is from a repairing restoration project that we visited when the Gila River Indian community um, hosted us, I think in 2018. So I guess my whole point here is that um, through this project and the others that I've been really, really fortunate to work with, um, I've, I've really come to recognize and embrace the reality of, you know, as scientists we have, um, we can bring stuff to the table, but we by no means do we know any, uh, all the answers. And so this idea of communicating directly with um, communities, understanding what they're interested in, what their needs are, how they're impacted, how we fit into their knowledge systems instead of the other way around is, is sort of important. And that's sort of how my group operates mostly, I hope. Um, and that's definitely how this particular project operates. Um, so basically, I mean, I guess my message is it's easy to do science in a vacuum, um, but oftentimes it has zero impact if you do that. Um, the kind of work that we're trying to do, especially in the context of indigenous communities and supporting sovereignty, has potential for high impact in the context of environmental change because um, you can actually directly work with a community who knows lots of stuff, there's lots of knowledge to the table, um, and we can add to that um, instead of overriding it. So that is pretty much all I have. I'm going to stop that screen share. Thank you. I'm somehow hearing music. <laughs> What's it mean? Anybody else hearing music? I hear it, but I found it coming. Huh. I don't know where it's going. You're the only one. It's me. Is it me? <laughs> I don't think it's Kimmy. you. Though. It's Kimmy, unfortunately. So we'll give her a moment to figure out where her music is coming from. We've really captured a moment in time with that, I think. That was very strange, but um, right, it was kind of like the wind down. I'm so sorry. Um, some some random internet tab went crazy. Thank you, Dan. Um, that was a, a great context and just an interesting introduction to some of your work. And what I what I love about your approach is that it honors uh, it honors traditional knowledge and works from this idea of sovereignty and community which feels uh, so important um, in this particular moment and in terms of this issue. So um, I'm gonna invite all of us back on. Are we all back on? Um, I don't see Terrell. See I'm here. Oh, you're there, okay. He's there. Good, there you are. Um, and I just have a, a couple, um, at least one main question that I'd like to ask before, maybe two, before we open it up to the audience. And um, what I'm interested in and what we've spoken about um, before is I'd love to hear from both you, Alice, and you, Terrell, about some of the environmental change that you've seen over the course of your weaving 
lives? Um, what kinds of changes you've seen in terms of the plants that you use? Can you can you each speak to that briefly? I can I can go first. Um, for me, I've noticed it. Uh, noticed that um, in picking our willows, they have become pretty brittle. Um, we used to have like two harvesting times. We would we would usually go like uh, right around March, and a long time ago, um, sometimes when we would go early in the because we go early in the morning, we could see our breath. But now when we go, we don't we don't see the breath anymore because it's not that cold, and um, and the willow is pretty brittle. So you, it's a really it it. It takes a, a quite a, a bunch of a lot of looking to be able to find something that is usable. Um, then when we also pick again in the summertime, um, it's kind of a it's kind of it's kind of hit and miss. You, you'll find like really, really um, uh, nice ones that you could really use, and you they they work really well. And then there's times when they're just not very good quality and um, even in storage, you know, a lot of time, because when we go gather, we'll, we'll, we gather bunches of them and we put them into re a little coils for uh, storage for later. Um, I noticed that they change faster. They don't stay like fresh as long as they us usually do. Um, and then they, the color changes quicker. So I don't know if there's, that, I was thinking that if if it's missing all the elements that it needs and, and when it's growing, you know, the, the, um, the, the heat, the hot, the heat and the cold to get it to where it needs to be, whatever chemical uh, process it takes, a lot of it's not happening. So it doesn't form as well as it had in the past. Um, so, um, it's kind of, we just have to, you know, gather what we can and use what we can. Um, and um, also for our, our cattails, because we use cattails for, for, um, the, for our weaving as well. Um, they're not growing as tall as they used to. Um, they're um, very kind of stunted in growth, yet they're in water the whole time, you know, and it's kind of, it's just, it's, it's just, it's kind of baffling. Um, and some of them also that they change color too as well. Um, Cause, and, and the reason why I know that is because over the years, you know, I've picked a lot of material. And so I'll have some from a few years back and then I'll gather more those. And the ones that I gathered recently start to change and, and the, the older ones still look better than the ones now. So I don't know if it's like chemical in the water. Um, I, I just think it's missing um, missing that that process as well. So um, we, we just do the best we can, you know, and go through and, and find the strongest ones that, that we can. But it's um, um, it, it, it's concerning because I, I I'm you know wondering you know the, the the weaving process you know they do they do foundation coiling all, all over the world. So I know that, you know, if these materials kind of aren't up to par anymore, we can always use others. Um, it's just hard knowing that it might get to that point if if um, the environment doesn't, doesn't get more stable. Carol, do you have anything? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, just like what Alice said, you know, we, we can definitely tell the difference right now with how our material is growing. Uh, this year, of course, in the desert, we didn't get much of a monsoon. So a lot of our yucca plants really didn't get that much water. So when I actually was picking um, in September, October, I noticed that a lot of the yucca, the new growth that we pick for baskets were, um, were short and were dry. And I, I, that really scared me because, you know, it, 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 I've never seen it before. But then I noticed that, you know, as a farmer working on the farm, but also working in, in, the, in the native um, 
um, food field, um, having a farm that relies solely on rainwater, it was a horrible planting season. So having to go out and pick material, it sort of shocked me as well to, not, to notice that the lack of water really affected the, the plants, um, the, the yucca plants and the bear grass. And for me, that was, you know, for a lot of other weavers, that's, a lot, that's their livelihood, you know, that is being affected when they go out and they pick um, and they pick for for the year they pick their supplies that are going to last for the year and that if you're picking dry material that isn't long enough <clears throat> or the color isn't there it affects their livelihood because they're what are they going to weave with you know for myself fortunately i do experiment with other fibers and work with other materials so for me it doesn't it, it it doesn't affect me as much as it would if I was solely just working with yucca or bear grass. Um, so the only reason why I was picking is because I teach in the community and I teach year round. So I, I usually teach um, uh, yucca basket weaving. Uh, so it, it definitely was a, a um, an eye opener for me to to see how the lack of water and the environment really um, affected the plants that I, I collect. Kimmy, can I ask a question? You can. For both Alice and Terrell. Um, so the articles in the articles that Kimmy wrote with you guys, it was clear that, that these changes are, you're observing these changes. Um, I'm wondering, and you, because you're both teachers as well, do you, are you teaching? So Alice, you mentioned that people use these different fibers for that kind of weaving all over the world. In your teaching, are you, um, having to adapt and, and say, we're gonna use this different kind of material now? Or are you still teaching, you know, this is the materials we use? Yes, I'm, I'm still using the same materials just to, uh, and part of what I'm, I'm needing to do here in, in, in the community is um, I wanna entice them in and keep them in. And then once you, you teach them how to weave and then you kind of introduce other things um, I think that that's kind of how how um, the plan's going to be because um, a lot of the weavers are, that I'm working with now are younger, really young, that don't have a lot of um, they have nothing to compare the materials to. You know, they they, they walked in a couple of years ago and right. it's already it's already their materials are already different, so they don't have anything to compare. Like me from 30 years ago, right. I know I know the difference. So that might be something that we'll, we'll have to explore um, when it really becomes obvious when, if we're unable to find those um, materials or they're not a good quality or they're, they're just not working. But right now there's still a little that do and I'm hoping that um, if push comes to shove, that's what we'll have to do is start experimenting with other, other materials that are are still of good quality. Yeah, and the same here. I mean, um, I'm hoping this year is uh, is a fluke, and I hope it does get better. You know, next year I hope rain comes and um, waters the ground. You know, and and it'll be a plentiful harvest next year. I'm hoping, but it hasn't come it hasn't come down to that yet, as far as me teaching with other materials for my students that are just beginners. I like to teach my students um, the traditional ways first, using that as a base, as a, as a, as a, um, as, um, a foundation so that they can start experimenting as they get more experienced. So for myself, I, I, I much rather use a material that I started with when I first started to learn and then have that freedom of, as you get experienced with that, <coughs> you get to um, experiment other different fibers and other materials. So I'm just hoping next year we'll have really good rain. What's the, the long-term forecast, Dan? <laughs> There's no such thing as a next summer forecast in uh, November, <laughs> but uh, the outlook is, is not long, long-term. It's, it's not 
great <clears throat> in terms of, um, I mean, wet summers are still obviously gonna happen, but there'll be fewer. But I mean, I think the thing that uh, one of the articles referenced, maybe it was you, Alice, the, it's the drawdown of water too. I mean, if you're using riparian plants, it's not just, it's precipitation is important, but it's also just mm -hmm. the pumping of groundwater, which the two are related obviously, right? If you, mm -hmm. it's not raining, people are pumping more groundwater. Yeah. And it's interesting to me that, um, you know, like as Terrell's work shows, um, you know, there's many directions that that baskets could go in. Um, and there's also a very core relationship that you both have with these specific plants. And I wonder, um, I'd, I'd like to uh, invite the audience to type in questions if they have them, but while they do that, I, I wonder if you could speak about that specific, because it's one thing to, um, to adapt, but there is still a potential loss of, of a relationship. Um, and I know you both spoke to me and um, about those specific relationships that you have and you, you know, even um, acknowledging the plants verbally. And um, you wanna, do you wanna um, talk a little bit about that, that specific? It's not just a thing you use, um, but it, that it is a relationship. I'm thinking. Well, go ahead, go ahead, Alice. Okay. Um, I'm thinking. You know, um, I, I did share with um, um, Kimmy about the times when we would go gather, and we have specific gathering places here in the community. Um, and it's when, when you go there, it's like you're 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 seeing um, old friends and. Um, one place in particular is right under the Granite Reef Dam here. Um, we've, I've been there several years. And um, back when we were having a lot of rain and snow up north, um, they would let the water go throughout the, through the dam there. And um, so by the time, uh, and it used to be like February when they let that water go. And then, um, so we'd be over there like in June to see you know, to, to have, uh, to go and start gathering. And um, it was, it, it, it's so awesome to see the same trees standing there that, um, uh, that you've picked for years on. And it's like, it, it, I feel really good because they survived that, all that rush of water that, that came there. Um, so, so the, the relationship is there. And I think, um, with with any plant, you know, once if if we're to start, um, you know, experimenting with others, that uh, that relationship would start with them as well, because um, their their help, you know, they were put here too for a reason, you know, and so now we would we're going to them to ask for their help, and. Um, I think that I love and respect we have for the other um, beings or plants and animals that that inhabit the earth with us would be um, extended as well. And sure, we would feel um, great loss and and um, sadness that the other one, the other other plants. Um, maybe if we did have to not use them anymore or they weren't no longer um, usable. Um, they, all, they, they, all, they also have other uses besides weaving too, you know, so they're not like totally abandoned. They're, they're, you still, they, still have, they still have other uses. Um, so, you know, I just, I think, I think, you know, and just thinking positive that, um, the weaving will still continue. It's just um, going to determine. We just have to determine how you know and which plants could help us, and that's like a lot of trial and error, probably too. Go ahead, Terrell. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, for Donna Autumns, you know, we originally were weaving with willow and cattail, 
but because of the farming and the, the, the water table dropping around the reservation, we didn't have willow and cattail um, trees anymore. Um, I think, Kimmy, I told you the story about how there was this, uh, a few willow trees in a village where one of my teachers taught me how to pick willow, and that's where I learned how to pick and clean it. And um, so I went and I picked in that village, and that was my father's village, um, Vomry, and um, it was around a charcoal. And so it got plenty of water, but once that charcoal started drying up and it wasn't holding much water, those willow trees died, you know? And so with that, um, a lot of the autumn people, Thana autumn people started weaving with yucca. And so that was because they adapted to the loss of the, the willow and the cattail, they went to yucca and, and bear grass. So, you know, I, I, I hope, and this is, this is just really f frightening for me is that I hope that, you know, we still, we still are able to be weaving with yucca and, 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 um, and bear grass, you know, because that's, that's what we woke with, but, you know, maybe this is how my work comes into play with experimenting with different fibers and material where maybe people are going to use my work as an example to say, well, we still can continue the weaving, but just using other material than yucca. You know, and for me, it, mm -hmm. it's a little bit sad. It's sad because I I love weaving with yucca. I, I love going out and picking. Like Alice said, you know, when, when they went picking, um, they could see their breath because it was a cold in the morning. And I remember waking up early in the morning during the summertime and traveling before the sun actually rose and get out there and pick because you want to pick before it gets really hot. You know, I just remember going and, and going and um, picking the yucca and cracking it, breaking breaking the, the center off and you hear this crack. And then you have this smell of just water and, and, and grass and, and just greenery and, you know, and, and then sitting under a tree with your family and friends and cleaning and laughing and, you know, and, and we pray, we pray before we pick because we pray and thank Creator for giving us this gift and this material, and as and as as weavers and as as um, stewards of the land, we only pick what we need, you know, and we take care of it. And 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 you know, if we if we don't if we're not able to do that anymore, then you know, what what's what's next? Yeah, I can really just hear in both of your stories the way that the act of choosing and being with plants is is actually woven into uh, a, a community um, identity and culture. Uh, we have a question from Pat Atkinson. Hi, Pat, <laughs> a folklorist that we know. Um, and she's asking, uh, there are some places where individuals are experimenting with cultivating the traditional native plants for weaving. Is this a possibility in Arizona? Cultivating, um, planting and cultivating. For me, yeah, it is. Um, I always tell this story about how a lot of the landscape that is done in, in, in the cities, like in the malls and the parking um, areas, there's yucca and bear grass that they use to fill in the, the little the little parking lots that they have there. And so a lot of the weavers that live in Tucson or big cities will go and harvest these materials, you know, and, it, and, and they get plenty of water because it's irrigated. So, um, and then and because of landscapes, they, they had to grow these materials to, for their landscaping business. So they grow bear grass, they grow um, yucca. So, you know, that definitely could be, uh, um, a, a, a choice or a, a method that we might use, um, but it requires a lot of water, you know. And if you if you plant these these materials down, say where I'm at, at the at the at the bottom of the 
in the desert, desert plains, uh, as opposed to its natural habitat, which is up in the mountains, you know, I would have to be watering those plants more often than, you know, to keep them alive, as opposed to them being grown in their in their area in the mountain ranges. Yeah. Our community um, established two riparian areas in our, our community. Um, I think they developed it so that they put all of the plants there that we normally use. Um, so they've they've done that to try to um, do what we can to keep them, you know, safe and 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 watered. And um, we still see um, some of the effects happen. The environmental effects happen be because um, a lot of it um, has to do with like temperatures and that kind of thing that we really can't control because it's ha the way we have it set up. It's along our our riverbed. And um, so it still um, goes through a lot of the, the, the environment. It, it's not changed because it's, it's not happening in the natural environment. It's still happening there. You know, the, the impact of the willow is still happening there too, as well. So, um, but it, it is um, a, a great asset still because we, um, we don't have to travel as far. Um, to go to get it, it's, just, it's, it's closer to where, where we're at here. Um, so so there, there is, you know, um, um, efforts to, to try to do our best to, or the communities doing their best to make sure that, that the plants are accessible to the, to the weavers. Thank you. Thanks, Pat, for that question. So if anybody has uh, questions, you can feel free to type them into the, the Q&A box. Um, Dan, I was wondering if, you know, sharing a little bit from um, the Indigenous Food Knowledges Network, if you're seeing similar um, scenarios from the Arctic to other areas of the Southwest in terms of diminishing supplies or getting creative about how to ensure future supply? Or I, I don't know if there's any comparable stories. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, for sure. I mean, I think the question is sort of what's the, like here it's gonna be water, like Terrell was mentioning about having to water the plants, like what's the limiter on the resource? Um, I mean, in the Arctic, um, so I spent several years in living in, in the subarctic, um, early in my career. And so that some of the stuff that I know about is from that time. Um, you know, the big changes there has to do with changing sea ice, for example. So indigenous communities that rely on hunting um, sea mammals are really heavily impacted by changes in sea ice. Basically, sea ice goes away, very hard to hunt. Um, so, you know, the, those food systems are disrupted. Same with salmon systems. Um, that's not maybe so much some of its climate, but some of it's just human disruption of those um, systems. So yeah, I mean, all over the Southwest, you hear the same thing. I mean, Hopi, we have the Hopi Foundation, well, the Not Money Coalition, which is part of the Hopi Foundation, which is their food program, um, is part of this project. Um, and, you know, that's something Hopi farmers have been dealing with for years. It's a shame Michael couldn't be here today, because of course that's what he does. Um, so they're well adapted, right? Thousand plus years of growing corn in that place and beans and other things. Um, but I mean, I, I guess the question is, is there a threshold where we start losing you know, either temperature or water or ice or whatever that, that disrupts these systems? I mean, I think the beauty of what Terrell and Alice are talking about is, especially at Terrell, I was thinking about, you showed that, that really cool piece that's um, creosote. Like if you made stuff out of creosote, that stuff will be alive long after we're all gone. Like you could make, you know, that could be a material forever. But the adaptability of, of um, artists and just people in general to live with what's there if they have to um, is some of the kind of the interesting things. And food systems are an interesting component of this because some of them can adapt and some of them can't. If you lose sea ice, it's gonna be really hard to hunt mm -hmm. seals, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I also was really struck, Terrell, by the, um, the accidental basket that you shared, uh, you know, this, this piece that fell and, uh, like kind of broke, you know, but and then could become something else. I feel like there's a, sort of a lesson in that um, 
in terms of both the way we way, way we approach things as artists and the way we approach things as scientists, right? They're they're you know who knows what we'll stumble on. Uh, not that we can guarantee that we'll stumble upon anything, but uh, I find that kind of a, a hopeful story. So uh, we've got a comment from Barbara. Why not make arrangements with the various shopping centers landscaped with bear grass and yucca that you would harvest there and then present the center with a basket made from those materials, which could be displayed in the central information area of the mall with explanatory notes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good idea, but it's fun telling the story about how weavers at the middle in, in the middle of the night will go and harvest things so they won't get caught. But, you know, um, yeah, I mean, that's a good idea. I, 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 never, I haven't been in the mall for years, so, but, um, you know, yeah, that's a good idea, you know. You did talk about, though, um, just the, like, the relationship with federal entities where you then need um, permission to harvest in certain areas, and that that is something that you now know how to navigate, but that it, it's, it's, it's an obstacle sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, you know, we work with the Bureau of Land Management and um, the Fish and Wildlife um, Program, and we've obtained um, permits permits for weavers to go out and pick in the on on their land, and um, it's worked out for a while. But again, uh, you know, you got to keep renewing these these permits and paying for these permits year after year after year. And, um, you know, I, I, I haven't actually picked on um, any of those, those lands in years because I, I, I've gone um, to the area where um, that's a little more closer to home, but, you know, it's getting harder and harder. Um, a lot of these weavers are going further and further into New Mexico to harvest uh, their yucca and their bear grass. Um, some of the weavers actually established relationships with um, landowners around um, the areas where they can actually go and, and pick on their land. So, um, and then um, other around Tucson area, there are weavers that actually have gotten permits to pick in, in, um, in certain areas in Tucson. So, you know, the possibility of working with um, um these um malls or there's only two malls i think in tucson right now um that um you know might be a possibility but i think that would be the last resort kind of thing <laughs> but do thank I, you for the idea i know i like the innovation of it yeah do either does, does any do you guys have, do you all have questions for each other um, Alice, do I have any questions for you? <laughs> well, your 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 e hook. How how do you, how, who grows your e hook? Where do okay. you get it? So we um, here in Salt River, and the e hook is the Devil's Claw. So um, for the past few years, there hasn't been a whole lot that grow here in Salt River. We look. There's a few areas where we might find some patches and stuff, but for the most part, um, what we're doing is um, we met some people from Blackwater, uh, a gentleman who has a garden. He had like 200 plants out there. So our basket weaving class um, met up with him and his wife and um, he stocked us up really well. And um, so when we need more, we just reach out to them and they're the ones who who we're, we're getting our um, e hook from, from, from the Blackwater area. So, and I think it's on their own personal land. So that's, that's really helpful. Um, and like for where I'm at here, where my, my home place, the land is very salty. So um, it's not, it's not, it doesn't grow well here. And I, I'm not, and that has to do with the water too. We, you know, there's, there's not as, um, groundwater going in as it used to, you know, into the land here as used the way it used to be. Um, well, a, a long time ago, all the ditches, our irrigation ditches were um, 
um, they were just, their ditches, they weren't cemented in. Now they're most, most of them are cemented in. So there's no water escaping, you know, that, that can um, uh, water these, the wild plants that are growing. Mm. So, so um, Blackwater is our, is our, our little gold mine over there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I only ask because Again, that's one of the materials that's been affected down here in Thana Atam. Um, Devil's Claw is really hard to, to come by now because it requires a lot of water. And traditionally, we had to grow it ourselves. You know, it's a cultivated um, material. But, you know, there's a lot of the younger people don't know how to grow it. So it's not really been kept going. So there's only a few weavers that still grow at home. Um, so, um, and we have a farm where we try to grow, but uh, it, it um, like I said, this year was just not a good year for, for planting mm -hmm. anything. Well, I, I, I'll have to, oh, excuse me. I have to put you in connection with them, Tarot. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Please do. Please do. I just have um, two more, two more short questions. I mean, one of them's long, but I'm just going to ask Dan to, um, I'm going to kind of put you on the spot, I guess, so you can decline. I'm just curious if, based on your um, your experience in climate science, if you might just speak briefly about what you've seen the field learn from indigenous knowledge. Oh, that's a good question. Um, sadly, not much, to be perfectly blunt. Um, science has not been great at this, but it's getting better, um, I think. Um, there's, a, there's been a push, to be perfectly fair though, there's been a push around the world um, for scientists working with indigenous communities, but a lot of it has been actually sort of harvesting knowledge in a way that's not good. So for example, small island nations or in the, across the Arctic are good examples, um, parts of Africa where scientists are going in and sort of using indigenous knowledge systems as data gathering, what's changing, that kind of thing. Um, and not really doing much to support the community or help the community or even put the, the Western science in context of um, indigenous knowledge systems. So it hasn't been great. Um, the turn that's starting to happen, I think, um, groups like mine are not that unusual anymore, um, where we don't do that, we try very hard not to do that. Um, but we're still an outlier. Um, I think the reality is that if you are working in the Arctic is a good example right now. There's, there are really good examples of very solid partnerships. Um, I can think of one, there's one in Clyde River in Nunavut um, in, the, in the high Arctic where the community is, is a major driver of, of a sea ice project. Um, the scientists are very much supporting the community's work um, with, with monitoring the community wanted monitoring, all this kind of stuff. So I can pull up to call to mind probably 10 really good examples. Um, but unfortunately, the, the tradition has been really pretty terrible in terms of either ignoring community um, concerns or communities, period, just spraying people with science, or essentially co-opting knowledge. Um, and I think that's becoming less and less acceptable. There's more and more people just saying, that's not okay. Um, we can't, we're not going to do that anymore. So yeah, it's sort of a bummer story, but it is, I think it's turning. It's just not turning fast enough, in my opinion. But academia is famously not good at changing. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and then just lastly, I'm wondering, I, I did ask um, Terrell this in, in our conversation some months ago, but I just wonder if you could answer it again of, um, or either one of you, um, Alice or Terrell, of, of what is an autumn basket at its essence? Go ahead, Alice. <laughs> <laughs> um, what is an autumn basket at its essence? For me, um, it's a symbol of life. It, it's it, it's it's a giver of life, not only um, helping us to. Um, use the plants that were given to us in the beginning of time, but also to 
um, when you're when you're weaving, and I kind of talked a little bit about this before, all the the teachings that it gives you as a person. Um, with a, a lot of it has to do, even especially in today's day and age, and um, is is patience and um, understanding and and knowing that you don't have you don't have um, control of um, everything, but you do have control of what what you do in your life and using these plants to guide it to build something to help your you and your family. Um, it's also um, a it's it's a gift that was given to us at the beginning of time and and able to 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 build one of these things you you have to um, it, it doesn't magically appear by itself there's a lot of things you have to put into it and and, and we're talking about um, gathering the materials now it's it's something that you can't go to the store and buy you can't, um, sometimes you can buy materials ready and prepare and all that, but the weaving process, there's been nothing, no type of computer machine or anything that has been invented to build this. And it comes from inside you. It, it, however, you know, looking at, looking at Terrell's creations, you just see that cr all that, those creative um, um, energies that he has and, how it reached outside of these other boundaries and went into these, you know, and using these different types of materials. That's what the weaving does. It, and creator gave us, each one of us the ability to create something um, with what's here on this earth. And, um, but it doesn't just magically pop into your lap and you're, you're going to pick it up and just know everything about it. You have to go through um, phases of of different types of um, development, I guess you would say. But that makes who you are as a person. And when you when you're weaving a basket and it, it starts from nothing really, just you and your your energy to go and do these things and put forth what you you're taught to 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 do, and then out of it comes this beautiful thing that this beautiful specimen that you made with your hands. And, and it, it's, it's very rewarding because you know that the feeling that you felt feel or that accomplishment and that joy or pride, and I, I talked about it before, that all our ancestors felt from the beginning of time. And you get to feel that too. That's your connection to all of those people that came before you. So it's life and it's a gift. And it's our responsibility to make sure that it continues, and um, and 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 to make sure that we're keeping our people strong with with that creative part, and that they're using all these teachings to become good human beings. Mm -hmm. And that's that's pretty much what it means to me. That's the essence of of the weaving. Beautiful, Tara. Um, what Alice said. <laughs> no, um, gosh, it, it's 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 what Alice said, but it's 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 again, you know, for myself, it's me, it's my teachers, it's my their teachers before them, you know, and it just goes on and on. It's that rich culture and history of of it being passed on, and it's the it's the vessel of. Of, of, of holding their spirit, their souls, you know? And when I, when I look at Alice's work, you know, I, I, I get really jealous because she's doing, she's working with willow and cattail that our people used to work with, but aren't anymore because they're, they're not around anymore. And she's weaving with, with materials that all our ancestors have woven with. But they're continuing to do that, and I, I, I get jealous because I'm, I, I'm like, wow, she learned that way, you know. And um, I learned with Yucca, which is another, you know, is 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 just amazing as well. But um, I, I always get a little envious because it's 
they're weaving with the material that our ancestors wove with, you know, but, um, and her work is amazing, but I, 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 I've known a few other basket weavers out there in Hilo River and in Salt River um, that do amazing work. And, you know, um, we have a basket group down here on Thana Atham and all the weavers get excited when they get to meet a, a, a willow basket weaver. You know, and we've always tried to line up um, classes with them, but it never just really could work because they're they're miles away and we're down here. So my goal is to eventually get some weavers to come and 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 teach our weavers willow willow basket weaving. You know, but it, it's just a it's a form. It's a it's again it's a gift that we were blessed with, and I'm so proud and and um, humbled to be part of that, that gift that I could share with other people, you know, my students and, and, and people that just want to get the, 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 the feel of it. So, you know, I'm just, that's what they, um, that's what you see in the baskets, my baskets. Thank you both so much for sharing um, that basket essence with us. Um, and thank you, Dan, for, uh, for, for coming and helping us understand a little bit of the context. And thank you to our ASL interpreters for being vessels for this language this evening. And thank you to Kate for running the tech. And thank you to Arizona Humanities for funding Climate Lore. And thank you to the Southwest Folklife Alliance for hosting it along with Border Lore, our monthly publication. We hope that you'll subscribe, it's free. And thanks to all of our uh, attendees this evening for listening and being patient. And if I didn't get to your question, I apologize. Um, just really grateful to be with you all this evening and thank you. Thank you so much. Have, thank a, you, Jimmy. have a beautiful Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Nice to see you all. Thank you. Thanks.